Let's kick things off with a look at the day's headlines. US President Donald Trump says he's open to direct talks with North Korea under the right circumstances. Speaking with his South Korean counterpart, the two leaders express hope this week's inter-Korean talks could lead to success for the world. The IOC will convene a meeting with officials from the two Koreas on January 20th to discuss the number of North Korean athletes for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, as well as issues over flags and anthems. Plus, offering incentives to make the country's secondary bourse more appealing, the South Korean government is set to announce additional policies to attract more institutional investors to the tech-heavy COSDAQ. Our top story this morning, though, U.S. President Donald Trump has reiterated his willingness to hold talks with North Korea. However, he told President Moon Jae-in that such talks will only take place when certain preconditions are met, meaning when Pyongyang is willing to give up its nuclear ambitions. Park Hee-joon starts us off. President Trump says he's open to holding talks with North Korea, but not without strict preconditions. The White House said Wednesday that Trump told President Moon Jae-in during a phone conversation that the United States is willing to speak to Pyongyang at the right time and under the right circumstances. For Trump, that means if North Korea is ready to give up its nuclear program. President Moon also thanked his U.S. counterpart for his role in bringing North Korea to talks. The South Korean leader credited President Trump for making the talks possible during his New Year press conference earlier that day. South Korea's presidential office also said Trump promised there would be no military action while inter-Korean talks are ongoing, adding that a recent Wall Street Journal report on the United States contemplating a military strike against North Korea was completely wrong. Following the phone talks regarding the possibility of North Korean discussions, President Trump told reporters at a White House cabinet meeting, Who knows where it leads? Hopefully it'll lead to success for the world, not just for our country, but for the world. And we'll be seeing over the next number of weeks and months what happens. And later at a joint conference with Norway's prime minister, President Trump expressed optimism, saying there were a lot of good talks going on. I think we're going to have a long period of peace. I hope we do. We have certainly problems with North Korea, but a lot of good talks are going on right now. A lot of good energy. I see a lot of good energy. I like it very much what I'm seeing. President Trump's remarks come just a day after the first inter-Korean talks in over two years. Washington has welcomed the talks as an important step towards solving the North Korean nuclear crisis. Tuesday's high-level talks resulted in North Korea saying it would attend the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and agreeing to peacefully resolve conflict through dialogue. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. Now, South Korea's top nuclear envoy has arrived in Washington for a three-day visit to discuss the current North Korea situation with senior White House officials. Speaking with Yonap News upon his arrival, Lee Do-hoon said the trip is built on the basis that South Korea and the U.S. have watertight cooperation when it comes to the security of the Korean peninsula. He said they will look at the results of the recent inter-Korean talks and how to move forward. He will meet with his U.S. counterpart Joseph Yoon and the senior director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council, Matthew Pottinger, among others. Now, speaking at his New Year press conference on Wednesday, President Moon Jae-in talked about South Korea's shaky relations with Japan over its wartime atrocities against Korean women, calling a 2015 agreement on the issue defective and a wrongful solution. The president called for a heartfelt apology from Tokyo to the victims of wartime sexual slavery. Kwon Jang-ho reports. President Moon was asked about whether he was satisfied with the follow-up measures to deal with the controversial 2015 Seoul-Tokyo Agreement on the issue of Japanese wartime sex slavery. This is how he answered. That solution, announced on Tuesday, is to discredit the agreement, saying it is fundamentally flawed, but not seek to renegotiate or dissolve it. Seoul also said Japan needs to voluntarily offer a sincere apology to the victims, which President Moon also reiterated. 
It's a response that has received a mixed reaction from those in Korea, with some understanding the need to maintain ties with an important regional partner, but seeing the move as doing little for the victims themselves. A sincere apology. It's hard to define what that exactly constitutes. And the Moon administration have said they will continue listening to the victims. But when the 2015 deal was reached, there were 47 registered survivors. Now there are only 31. There's not much time to have their voices heard. Meanwhile, Tokyo's initial reaction has been strongly negative, saying Seoul must honor the deal and that an official complaint will be made. And in response to Seoul's calls for an apology, those in Japan will point to the deal as a form of official apology. But there is an argument that Tokyo has not honored the deal either, with several senior officials denying the atrocity, most notably at a hearing of women's rights issues at the UN in 2016. Tokyo must also consider the need for good relations with Korea, especially with issues such as the North Korean threat in the region. The 2015 deal was one Prime Minister Abe actively pursued, and if it were to be broken or renegotiated, it would do a great deal to his political image at home. But there are many areas where he needs to maintain relations with Seoul, so despite strong words, he is unlikely to take strong action. Snubbing Seoul's invite to Pyeongchang 2018, though, remains likely. With both countries understanding the importance of their partnership, a total breakdown of the bilateral relationship is not expected. But tensions will remain, and for the victims, the comfort women issue, which the deal said had been resolved in 2015, is definitely not over. Kwon Jang-woo, Arirang News. Now, North Korea's representative to the International Olympic Committee was at the IOC headquarters on Wednesday to discuss North Korea's participation at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics here in South Korea. This comes after North Korea agreed to send a delegation to next month's Games, a decision that marks a symbolic diplomatic breakthrough for the two Koreas. Park Soyeon with the details. Officials say Pyongyang's IOC representative Chang Ung spent four hours meeting with IOC President Thomas Bach on Wednesday before leaving in a car without speaking to reporters. Following the meeting, the International Olympic Committee said it will hold further talks with representatives of two Koreas on January 20th at its headquarters in Lausanne. Chang Ung and South Korea's IOC member Ryu Sing Min will partake in the talks, as well as Pyeongchang 2018 officials and the president of North and South Korean National Olympic Committees, with Bach acting as chair. They will discuss a series of essential decisions on North Korea's participation at the Olympics. The nature of the talks will include the size and names of the athletes in North Korea's delegation, as well as the format of participation, such as issues related to official protocol, including flag ceremonies and uniforms. It's not yet known which flags and anthems will be used for North Korea, but South Korea has suggested athletes for the two Koreas march together at the opening and closing ceremonies under a united flag. Earlier this week, Bach said he warmly welcomed North Korea's decision to take part in the Olympics, adding the joint proposal has been applauded by many other governments worldwide. He also called North Korea's participation as a great step forward in the Olympic spirit. North Korea's figure skating pair has secured a spot for the Olympics, but missed the October confirmation deadline to register. However, the IOC has extended the deadline for North Korea's participation, raising the possibility for the duo to compete in Pyeongchang. Other athletes may also qualify through special places offered by the IOC. With achieving peace at the core of the Olympic ideal dating back to ancient Greece, watchers are hopeful North Korea's participation may offer a much-needed breakthrough in inter-Korean relations. Park Soyeon, Arirang News. Offering incentives to make the country's secondary bourse more appealing, South Korea is about to announce additional policies to lure more international and uh, institutional investors to the tech-heavy COSDAQ. The new policies from the Financial Services Commission are said to include relaxing listing rules on the market and the creation of a 280 million US dollar fund to invest into COSDAQ listed firms. The new rules will allow a company to be listed on the COSDAQ if it meets one of three criteria, profits, market capitalization and paid in capital. 
The countdown is on now with less than one month to go until the curtain goes up on the 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympics. South Korea's athletes are pushing their minds and bodies to the limit to be ready for the biggest moment of their lives. Team Korea is in the hunt for medals and is fortunate enough to have some of the best training facilities in the world. Our EG1 went to see how preparations are going. Here at Jincheon National Training Center, located southeast of Seoul in Chungcheongbuk-do province, members of the Korean National Short Track Speed Skating team are fully immersed in their rigorous training on the rink. Short track is Team Korea's winter forte, and hopes are high that this discipline will secure at least half of the eight gold medals Korea aims at winning during next month's Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. We have almost completed our fitness training. Now we must boost our techniques and speed as well as work on faults we've had in previous competitions. The team lost the last couple of matches due to body contact with other skaters, prompting the team to focus on this unpredictable variable. While it's important not to veer too far from your lane when trying to avoid body contact with an opponent, it is better to be clear of the situations altogether by speeding up. So we are putting a lot of emphasis on speed training. Over at the weight training center, the men's ice hockey team is hard at work too. The team has been toughening up its fitness program, as muscle workout is even more important around this time, not only to enhance power, but also to help the athletes get the right postures to prevent injuries. And surprisingly, a lot of the training has been taking off the ice. So all the exercises these players do now, we have adapted uh, an off-ice program that allows them to transfer all their energy off the ice, all the workouts they've done off the ice, onto the ice. So it, it's become very sport specific. Team coordination and gaining experience in actual competitions are two other important factors when it comes to training, especially when the sport is curling. As such, the Korean curling team is expected to participate in Canada's Grand Slam of curling later this week, where the team members are expected to learn firsthand how to deal with the pressure of an actual game. These trainings help us adjust to the physical changes on the ice while hundreds of spectators are watching and cheering. We're also learning to concentrate and cope with the pressure in an actual game. Despite the tight schedule, the Korean women's curling team is hopeful that it'll win the country's first gold medal in curling at PyeongChang 2018. Although each team and athlete has different goals for the upcoming Winter Games, they share the same hope of doing their best and showing the results of their four years of dedication and hard work at next month's global sporting event. Lee ji Arirang News, Jincheon. Now, the central themes of the Winter Olympics are information technology, peace and culture. And in line with those, South Korea has officially unveiled its uh, commemorative coins and banknotes for the Games. Won jong hwan with the details. The organizers of the PyeongChang 2018 Winter Olympic Games have showcased a new set of commemorative coins and banknotes to the public for the first time in Seoul on Wednesday. Last year, 11 kinds of commemorative coins were released at the first sale and 12 kinds at the second sale. This time, we have put all of them together, as well as the commemorative banknotes inside the 888 limited edition set to commemorate the upcoming 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympics. This special set of commemorative coins and banknotes consists of four gold, 15 silver and two bronze coins, along with three kinds of banknote. Just 888 sets have been made. This number comes from combining 88 from the 1988 Seoul Olympics and 8 from PyeongChang 2018. The set costs just over 10,000 US dollars. The first customer to purchase the set of special coins and banknotes was Korean R&B singer In Sunhee, who is an honorary ambassador for the PyeongChang 2018 Winter Games and the singer of the PyeongChang theme song, Let Everyone Shine. Insuni's personal name was also engraved on her commemorative set. And those who purchase a set can also have their name engraved on their set and will also have their name written on the plaque at the 2018 PyeongChang Memorial Hall. 
the special set of commemorative coins and banknotes will be available to pre-order from the 15th to the 26th of this month from major banks and post offices or online at the Pungsan Hwadong website. Meanwhile, as the two Koreas agreed on Tuesday that the North will send a delegation to the next month's Winter Olympics, the organizing committee expects the occasion to be a rare chance for inter-Korean exchanges. Although we are highly confident of pursuing a cultural Olympics and IT Olympics, previously we had some concerns about a peaceful Olympics for Pyeongchang 2018. But now that North Korea has decided to participate, we are very confident that we can achieve the Peace Olympics as well. South Korea hopes that the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics could set the tone for bringing peace to the divided peninsula. Won jong Arirang News. Now let's shift our focus to some tech news, uh, big data, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. The reach of the fourth industrial revolution can be felt in almost every industry now. Its impact can also be very clearly felt in the health sector. Our Kim Hesung reports. 72-year-old Hwang Gi-hyun is visiting the doctor to see how the surgery went. Just a week ago, Huang got artificial joint replacements in both legs. The arthritis got worse until it reached a point where I could hardly walk. I came here because I heard it did robotic surgery. The surgical robot enables surgeons to do knee or hip replacements using 3D computer imaging based on a CT scan, making the robot remove the areas of bone as mapped out by the surgeons. The biggest advantage of the robotic surgery is precision. It has a margin of error of less than half a millimeter in surgery operations compared with a surgeon's five millimeters. Optimal implant size and positioning means less pain, a faster recovery, and a better outcome for patients. Since the robot was first developed in the late 1990s, the latest version has been passed by both the U.S. and Korea's Food and Drug Safety Ministries as of 2017 and is now being used in more than 13 hospitals in Korea. It's not just robots that are supporting doctors. Artificial intelligence is also being used to analyze enormous amounts of data, diagnose illnesses and provide a treatment plan for cancer patients. In this room, seven doctors are discussing treatment options for a uterine cancer patient. One of the doctors, a supercomputer. This AI computer is loaded with 12 million cancer research papers and medical cases. It then compares the data with the patient's genetic records. After a round of discussion, surgery, then chemotherapy is announced as the best treatment option. Since adopting Watson a year ago, the hospital has treated over 550 cancer patients with a supercomputer. Through accumulating data and making corrections whenever the computer program gives a wrong answer, the decision concordance rate between AI and human doctors went up by around 7 percent over the past year. And satisfaction among patients is high. Multidisciplinary approach with doctors from various departments working with AI instead of one-on-one -on -one doctor to patient treatment is changing medical diagnostics. AI healthcare market alone is projected to reach 6.6 .6 billion US dollars by 2021 and expand into areas like preventive care. High costs and improving accuracy are still challenges for the robotics and AI industry, but what was once considered just hype is slowly becoming a new reality of healthcare. Kim Hye Sung, Arirang News. Now it's time to take a look at the stories making headlines around the world. And we're going to start with the French president's trip to China. Emmanuel Macron has wrapped up his visit there. He gave a slew of gifts and promises to woo the world's second largest economy. For more on this and other news from around the globe, let's turn to our Noah Adam. So, Adam, what were the highlights of Macron's trip to China? Well, Mark, at the start of his three-day visit, Macron ga uh, came bearing gifts, including a horse from the French presidential cavalry. He also paid a visit to an ancient capital to pay respects to China's first emperor. Beijing may also be set to place a large order of Airbus planes, as Macron said his Chinese counterpart. Xi Jinping had confirmed to him that a contract would be finalized shortly. 
French media are reporting that 184 planes would be delivered to 13 airlines in the years 2019 and 2020, a deal which could be worth at least 18 billion US dollars. Meanwhile, French beef producers hailed a deal reached during Macron's visit that Beijing would end its embargo on French beef imposed in 2001. It was put in place after Europe's mad cow disease scare of the late 1990s. French power group Areva also signed an MOU with China National Nuclear Corps for cooperation in nuclear waste processing. The French president is hoping to relaunch EU-China relations often strained by Beijing's restrictions on foreign investment and trade. The deals and promises made during Macron's state visit have shown signs that Beijing's relationship with Europe may be shifting. Mudslides and flooding caused by heavy rain in Southern California earlier this week have now left at least 17 people dead and more than two dozen injured. Officials in Santa Barbara County fear the death toll could rise and there are about 13 people reported missing. Most of the fatalities occurred in the wealthy suburb of Montecito where powerful mud flows lifted houses from their foundations. The weather cleared up on Wednesday allowing rescue teams to intensify operations. One of the biggest events on the Czech calendar kicked off this week, with firms showing off their latest gadgets and innovations. But this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas has mostly been dominated by autonomous vehicles, with a focus on artificial intelligence motoring. Toyota, for example, unveiled the e pallet which the firm says is a multi-purpose transportation and mobility platform. The carmaker says the interior can be customized to meet the needs of partner companies, which so far include Amazon, Pizza Hut and Uber, among others. Its fellow Japanese rival Honda, meanwhile, unveiled its 3E concept, or Empower, Experience and Empathy. It envisions a future in which multiple robotic devices work together as a system to help people in everyday tasks. They include an autonomous off-roader designed to help with heavy-duty work, a robotic wheelchair of sorts, to help people get around and a light bulb shaped device on wheels that is designed to understand the needs of people and offer assistance accordingly. Good morning. Brace yourselves for sub-zero temperatures today. Cold wave alerts are in place across much of the country, including here in the capital, while heavy snow alerts remain in effect in the Cholado and Chungcheongdo provinces, with those regions seeing 15 to 30 centimeters of heavy snow fall. And even more snow will fall in those regions through tonight, so be extra careful. In fact, the Cholado regions are under both cold and heavy snow advisories. And for now, here are the readings for the day. Seoul will only make it to minus 7 degrees Celsius this afternoon, and other southern regions will also have negative territory afternoon highs this afternoon. And we'll see even colder temperatures tomorrow with a low of minus 15 degrees Celsius here in the capital. Then Mother Nature will give us break for the time being with a milder temperatures. With that, let's take a look at the international weather for beers around the world. Well, most regions in South Korea will have brutally cold weather with heavy snow in some southern regions. Most re cities in North Korea will see freezing temperatures but more sunshine. And as for the rest of Asia, those of you in Beijing will also have some bone chilling temperatures at a high of minus 1 degree Celsius this afternoon. Meanwhile, those in Melbourne will have plenty of sunshine and blue skies, so have your sunblock ready. Heading to North America, Chicago is once again in for a wild stretch of weather conditions that could see temperatures climb into the double digits on Thursday before turning to freezing again by the weekend. And as for South America, Rio de Janeiro, Santiago and Buenos Aires will be hot and sunny. Taking you to Europe, many major cities on the map will have a wet Thursday. Lastly, to Africa, Algiers will have another rainy day. And that's all the weather update for now. 
And that's where we're going to leave the news for now as well on this Thursday morning here in Seoul. Our next bulletin is coming up at noon Korea time. So until then, goodbye.